the most valuable commodity within the organization are people. That ship will not sail without healthy individuals, but they got to be able to trust the person steering the ship. Welcome back, viewers, watchers, listeners, Blue Grip Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Tyler Owen. And Clint McNeer. What's going on? Not a lot of getting ready for Christmas. Have all my shopping done, I think. How about you? You know, I've never, I've always been that kind of procrastinator. I never, I wait till like the last day. I'm that guy. Uh, but my wife is not one to kind of have a list ready and, you know, it is, it, it is frustrating because I, I, I admitted, I, I admit this. I did not get her a, a present one year and it was because she said i don't need anything i've got you mm-hmm. hint hint and so the day of uh, i didn't have anything under the tree for my wife so i was like well you, you followed orders. orders you didn't want anything and my god what a mistake that was so for you listeners watchers viewers voyeurs uh recommendation for your spouse highly 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 recommend you do not listen to them when they need a Christmas gift, you go out there and uh, pull the trigger, no pun intended, and go ahead and get that gift because they will greatly, greatly appreciate it. So I don't want anything means I would like something? 100%. Okay. And we're supposed right. to know that as men uh, or spouses, you know, that they're they're telling us a fib. So, uh, and our kids, I mean, you know, and nowadays we as parents give them everything anyway for the most part. And so it's just... I don't like Christmas. I like the season. I like the for the you know what it stands for. I don't like the gift exchange and so forth. So. And these are things we don't know as men. That's why I, I remember Janet now saying that women are from Mars and <laughs> yeah. Tyler's from Uranus. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that punchline. <laughs> Thank you for that. Enter our guest, man. We've got often the theme on the show is leadership, and there's nothing more important to. Law enforcement and law enforcement's kind of a paramilitary um, profession. Yeah, and if you have a failure in the military, it, it trickles down, and, and you have lots of issues. And that's a parallel that we see in law enforcement today. And we have a guy on that is an expert and an instructor in leadership, um, and I'm more proud to call him a friend, Mike Alexander. Yes, you know I don't know about the expert thing, but. Um, <laughs> Definitely glad to be here with yeah, you guys. Yeah, welcome to Blue Grit. Appreciate like, you coming on. Absolutely, absolutely. We like to kick. Uh, we like to kick them off with who in the heck's Mike? Tell us about where were you born and, and kind of growing up, and who is Mike? Yeah, um, I grew up in a very small town in Florida. Um, um, I was a farmer uh, for the most part. Uh, really? Yeah, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, what yeah. part of Florida? Central. It's a little okay. small town called Fort Meade, Fort Meade, Florida. But and, and it was a unique uh, experience as a child. I uh, we traveled uh, during the summer months, uh, picking various fruit and vegetables for a living. Traveling in Florida? Or no, no, in Florida. No, I went to seven states per year. Oh, wow. Actually, yeah. I we started in Florida picking oranges. Uh, and when the orange season was over, we went to Georgia and picked uh, peaches. Um, and then we left Georgia and went to South Carolina to do the very same thing. But uh, we included apples there and cherries. And then we went to North Carolina for apples, plums, and things of that wow. nature. And then we went to uh, Virginia, West Virginia, New York. And then we went back to Florida. So I did that. Until I was 17 years of age, and then I, um, I How young when you started that? I was, from the time I can walk and talk, that's what I did for No that. kidding. Yeah. That's yeah. where your work ethic comes from. Yeah. My, um, my dad owned a company called the Alexander Packing Company. So, and that's what we did. He had about 300 employees. Oh, that, wow. That traveled with us. Um, so we migrated from, from state to state. So I went, to probably three, four schools per year. Um, and because of, not because of uh, IQ, I got a opportunity here in Austin at the, at St. Louis University. They had a program over there still today, have that program called CAMP. CAMP is an acronym for 
College Assistance Migrant Program. And they give you a one-year scholarship. And that scholarship is designed to get you through that first year. Because research says if you can get through the first year of college, the possibility exists you can make it through the rest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they gave us a mentor um, to get me through that first year. And then scholarships and things of that nature got me through the rest of my years at uh, at St. Ed's. And, yeah, so that's kind of how I grew up and how I ended up in, in Austin, Texas. It was a small town, uh, relatively speaking, when I got here, 300,000 or so, um, in 1970, I'm dating myself, 79 uh, is when I got here uh, to go to school over there. What was your degree in? Criminal justice. I started out in business, but um, I did not want to be in college, and I partied more than anything else. In fact, I ended up on academic probation because I partied so much and got my dad's attention, and he said, hey, you better get it together. And so I had to go over to um, ACC, where I'm now um, a professor, college professor over there, but I had to go there to get my uh, GPA up to come back. And, and graduate from from St. Ed's. Mm-hmm. So when you transitioned from the business um, plan, degree plan, what made you transition over to criminal justice? Well, you know, college campus, um, I was looking for, um, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, to be quite frank. And I met some college students that uh, was in criminal justice. So I said, you know, I take a class as an elective. So I did and I, I just caught the bug. You know, my, my dad always had a, a very good relationship with police officers. Um, so I, um, that just all came back to me when I ended up in that classroom. And I said, wow, this is, this is awesome. And so I, that was it. And I started in that degree. My, my roommate was a uh, criminal justice um, uh, degree. Major. Yeah, Major, thank you. And uh, he started out at Travis County Sheriff's Office, so I ended up getting a job over there as well. So that's where I started in the jail for about a year and a half or so, working in the jail. And then they created this transportation division where we transported prisoners back and forth to TDC. So I did that for two and a half years or so, and then I, I applied for APD. So when you got hired on at Travis County originally, as a jailer or mm-hmm. as a sworn deputy? I was a sworn academy? deputy but worked in the jail. You went through Travis County's academy? Didn't have to go through an academy at all. No. I had, yeah, that was back in the day. I had, a, I was old. I mean, in the old days, Dawn Bailey was the sheriff. I had a college degree. He brought me into his office, raised my right hand, swore me in. I was a cop. Wow. Yeah. Because you had the degree. Because I had the degree. No, no academy whatsoever. I didn't go to an academy until... I got the APD, but I did not have to take the T code exam when I graduated from the academy there. So I have no idea what that T code exam is like uh, because I I had a degree when I went in. Yeah, we talk on the show a lot about <clears throat> being a jailer mm-hmm. is a good foundation because Absolutely. you have to learn yes. to get along with people, yes. how to book in a drunk angry prisoner. Yes, but if you traveled around your basically your whole life having mm-hmm. to meet new people, mm-hmm. go to change schools all the time, mm-hmm. you probably had to develop some communication skills pretty early on. I did. I did. Yeah. I found myself in some pretty difficult situations and yeah, I just had, I had to learn how to talk and communicate and get along with people to talk my way out of situations from the time I could remember. And I tell you the jail experience I recommend that for every person who's considering law enforcement because of the very things that you guys just said. Uh, It gives you the opportunity to really uh, hone your skills of communication and that that EQ more so than the IQ. Mm -hmm. Building relationships are probably one of the most, it's the foundation. It's actually the conduit for influence is that relationship. Do you think going to college was more valuable? Which was more valuable in your opinion or in your career, working in the jail setting or having that college degree? The jail setting. However, I don't, uh, I, I, I extremely value the, the college experience, right. but the, all the college did for me was give me the, the 
theory of the theoretical uh, experience and the jail itself gave me the practical application of the theory. Yep. And so I great way to put it. Yeah. Great way to put it. We talk about that a lot is the departments that kind of constrict or restrict yourself from having the applicant pool from just having solely college applicants Mm -hmm. instead of having the uh, work history Mm -hmm. that this is what Mm -hmm. you're talking about. And so, Mm -hmm. I kind of want to get your perspective on yeah, you yeah. the college degree. I, you know, I don't devalue it by right. any means, but you can't beat the practical experience, life experience. I get the college degree and the IQ and the ability to critically think your way through things, but you also need to be able to understand people. Yeah. Yep. And having life experience gives you that people experience. Mm-hmm. So work in the jail, um, they develop a transportation division. Mm-hmm. So you move over, um, I guess, like transport, going picking up warrants from different counties or taking the hospital. Or- yeah, we're doing all of that, all of that. We're picking up warrants. We were mainly, our our main job was transporting prisoners to and from court uh, to doctor's appointments throughout the city. And then every Friday we did what they call a chain run. So we... We, we took 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, to TC until TC started coming to Austin to take them themselves. Well, the old bluebirds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, what year was that, Brother? That was 1981 is when I saw it there. Okay. And then uh, where'd you go from transport? I, I went back to the jail for a little while, and then I, I went over to ADD in 1984. Kind of a lateral program? Or no, 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 I had to, to apply, get in the academy, go through their six-month uh, police academy before graduating, becoming a cop in South Southwest Austin. How big was APD back then? It was uh, around 750 officers when I... They're back down to that today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's wow. Like, Sad. Anywhere it's southwest, so, yeah, yeah, so like down towards, like yeah, it was, it, at the time it was Davis Sector, um, which is out by Barton Creek Mall. Okay. That area is where I worked. Nice. Um, academy and then like an FTO program? Yes. Um, I guess 22 weeks, I don't recall, 16, 22 weeks of FTO program before I graduated from the FTO program and got my own police vehicle and I was, back then, I was what we call David 4. Um, was my, my call number. Explain kind of the, the, the mentality of kind of Austin. And we, and we see Austin now, uh, and Clint and John went to a class in California, and the um, a reference they made to Austin was that these California cops were in this class, and Clint can talk about it better than I can, but... They talk about just how difficult the challenges that Austin PD is going through right now. And Cal, people in California were looking at a video and showing all this Austin rhetoric. And it was embarrassing for Clint John mm-hmm. to go to this and be like, my God, my own state. Mm-hmm. We're talking about the difficulties and challenges of what's going on in Austin. You being there in the 80s, mm-hmm. kind of explain the, you know, I've heard that time and time again, Austin was a small city. It was only 300,000. Well, 300,000 is a fairly large city. Right. But the feeling of the of the small town vibe on the big city scale, kind of go into detail of you being a street cop uh, and, and, and the community policing aspect. It's always been around with Austin police. Right. It's always been there. Mm-hmm. Talk about the small town feel that Austin had at that point in time. Well, yeah, that was one of the things I enjoyed about working uh, with Austin. But, you know, I, at the same time, I, I will say I took my experience with Austin for granted. I didn't know what I didn't know until I left and realized how well prepared Austin uh, prepared me to go out and do other things in other cities. But we did have a very uh, cohesive, small-town feel, uh, and community policing was really our mantra. Um, We knew the community fairly well, and the community knew us. Um, And so, uh, in fact, I even worked in a unit we call district representatives. I don't know if they have those, those guys anymore, but... We, we all had uh, our own beat, and we were responsible for the crime in that community, and we leveraged the resources both internal and external to fight crime because I think everyone knows that crime isn't a police problem. It's a community problem, 
and the police are designed to help the community uh, address their issues. And, you know, you look at the, 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 the appealing principles and where he says that the police are the public and the public are the police. The only difference between the two is the police are paid to give 24-hour service to what's incumbent upon every citizen. So it is all our responsibility, and that's really how Austin embraced it for many years um, until we, what we have now. And, and Austin has always kind of been music-oriented, mm-hmm. um, a little artsy-oriented, mm-hmm. but it hasn't always been nutty mm-hmm. off the rails. Well, mm-hmm. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's always kind of been like a, a marathon and a bar for kind mm-hmm. of music and RC, but um, it just wasn't crazy. No, it was a, it was a great place to be. It was the, it was it was almost a secret. Uh, it was such good quality of life when you think about and you compare to the San Antonios, the Houston's, and the Dallas. And one of the ways I compare to three to four cities is the the homicide rate. You know, back in the 80s and the 90s, we were running 20, maybe 30 homicides per year. Um, They're having that now in two or three months. Um, And some of the things that I see today, I just don't believe that this is the same Austin that I I grew up in. And loved. Yeah, and loved. Yeah. Yeah. And it it is painful to to actually watch uh, Austin explode and implode. Yeah, in so many different ways is what, what we see happening before to, before our very eyes. And those of us who grew up in this city, it, it, it is just absolutely unbelievable to watch and experience. So how long did APD before you headed out and became the Lion? I did uh, 20, almost 26 years with Austin before I left Austin. And I went over to uh, Office of Inspector General, which is uh, there's three of those, as you know. Uh, TDCJ is the most uh, popular one. And then you have juvenile justice. And then you have health and human services. I went to health and human services. And when I got there, we did not have an official law enforcement branch. But we had a lot of police officers like myself were either retired and some were in transition. And so I was retired. And that was really going to be my retirement job. And six months into that job, something happened down in Corpus Christi where the employees for entertainment purposes, they they will pull um, people with mental, physical disabilities out of their rooms, middle of the night, put them in a circle, make them fight each other. And, wow. they, and they recorded it for for their own entertainment. They, one of them lost their phone at a Walmart, and whoever found it turned it into the police because of what they saw on the phone. And because the governor appoints the inspector general, it made its way to Austin. When the governor saw it, he immediately called an executive session, and and Senate Bill 643 was created. When Senate Bill 643 was created, it gave us, OIG, Internal Affairs, an unbudgeted mandate to create a law enforcement branch within our system. So I was promoted to captain, and another guy was promoted to captain, and we were given uh, the the job of building a police department from scratch within that system, uh, which we, we did. And then shortly thereafter, I was promoted to major. And so I spent another year and a half there as the major. And I had 30 officers or so strategically uh, planted throughout the state of Texas. And we were dealing mainly with abuse, neglect, exploitation, or anything that had an HHSC nexus that were criminal in nature was under my umbrella. We handled those things and then uh, I get a call from a search firm to go out to East Texas to Palestine to be the chief of police and that's where I went next. What year did you leave uh, OIG? I left there in 14, I believe, 13, 14, something like that and ended up in Palestine. I think it was uh, I left in Late 13 and ended up in Palestine early 14. And you went in directly as the chief or interim initially? Yeah, it was interim. I went in as interim. And I never actually transitioned to the actual chief because 11 months into that interim job, That's right. I get a call from the mayor at about 11 o'clock one night 
asking if I would sit in the city manager's seat for six weeks. And because I was sleep dazed and confused, I said yes. <laughs> for those that don't know where Palestine's at, you're probably uh, Louis- Shreveport, Louisiana. Tyler, you're probably 50 miles southwest of Shreveport. Yes. You're probably 20 miles east of Tyler. It is deep, deep East Texas. Yes, it it's is. not Southeast Texas. And it's not Northeast Texas because there is a difference. Mike, That's right. You can back me up on that. It is deep, deep East Texas. Yes, sir. So absolutely, great city, great department. Yeah, yeah. Good yeah. People out there. Yeah. Yep. I, so I did. I did three years, three and a half years there as the city manager. At what point in there did you stand up um, the Lion Development Group? Actually, the Lion was. Well, I stood this thing up in 1999, to be quite frank. It was dormant, but it was there. Uh, and I did that because of the work. While in Austin, I did a, probably 10 years or so, I was I did a lot of work with DOJ. And I was traveling across the country dealing with the underbelly of police departments um, around ethics and integrity issues. Uh, that's when I think Clinton was in office, I believe, and he stood up. Uh, no relation. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> he had these 36 regional community policing institutes. And I, I because I was a community policing officer in Austin, um, I got an opportunity to be connected with DOJ, and I began to travel across the country and even abroad. A couple of times. Oh, doing, cool. Doing a variety of things. And I guess that is kind of what began your career of being a fixer and understanding how to go in and identify the core of the problem and try and start figuring out how to resolve that? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and, and Palestine was really my first uh, official as the executive experience in doing so. And I can tell you... Um, I thought I was a grown man uh, before I got there, but Palestine actually, uh, I became a real, truly grown man in Palestine because it tested every fiber in my my yeah. my body uh, because of the, the challenges that they were up against. Uh, prior to my arrival, they, it was a volatile removal of the previous chief. And I didn't know that. I had no idea. Uh, in fact, uh, I hate to even say I didn't even do my research when they called me. Didn't even think about doing research. And once I got settled, I started doing my research after I signed on the dotted line. And I saw all of that stuff that was going on. And at, at that moment, I realized that it was going to be an uphill battle. I just didn't know how uh, steep. Yeah, how tall hill, that yes, is. I had be. no idea until I got in in the and got in the middle of it, and then I discovered I was in the precipice of uh, hell on earth. (laughs) (laughs) But what's cool is that set off a chain of stops for you, either interim police chiefing or interim city manager. Mm -hmm. And over the course of that, you've developed a reputation of when, when it's hit the fan or... When things need to be fixed, you can come in and fix it. And, Mm -hmm. man, that's a really unique – cops are alphas, and we think we can fix anything Mm because we get a calls and we have to fix it. But Mm -hmm. going in and fixing a broke organization, that takes a – that's a tall order. It is. It is. And, 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 uh, you know, I think the the, there are four things technically Mm -hmm. that I've kind of discovered um, over time. Mm that are, are missing from these agencies. Number one, uh, the culture typically is fairly toxic at the time. That's number one. Number for two. For various reasons. Yes, for yeah. various reasons. And a lot of times it's because of a lack of information in time and space create the toxicity uh, within the, the organization for, for a variety of reasons. And what happens is um, leadership stop focusing on the things in which they need to focus on. Um, and so at that point, you have a toxic culture, no leadership engagement. Uh, there's no psychological safety in the, in the organization, and people are suffering. And so you have a lot of mental health issues or mental illness in police officers that are happening within that. And, then, and because of that, the, the critical thinking 
is flawed. And so you then you begin to see mistake after mistake after mistake. And you see cannibalism take hold of that organization and yeah. people are attacking each other. And on top of that, the community where they really should be focused on serving, right? they're negatively affected because the people that are trying to help them can't that's, help themselves. That's right. So in order to fix an organization like that so that you can serve the community better, you have to go in to come out. Mm-hmm. So literally, uh, not literally, but figuratively, you have to do heart surgery on that organization in order to do so. And, and, it's, and it's very careful. You have to be very careful. And I have just learned in dealing with people, there are really like seven things that I I have embraced sort of as my, um, uh, as my kind of my mantra, my theme when I go in to, to address those kinds of issues. Uh, and I and I just kind of walk through those things very carefully in dealing with trying to get, remember that relationships are the conduit of influence. So the first thing I have to do is get to know my people. Um, and if, if in getting to know them, that means I have to get very close to them. Then I, and I have to be able to uh, display, uh, put on display four things within that's coming from me, and that's empathy, sympathy, vulnerability, and compassion. I need to be able to show those things to my people so that they can begin to trust me. Yeah, otherwise they probably just think you're some some bully coming in there to start ripping, you know, rip us open and firing people. And right, because they, they're, they're, well, like, they're in a vortex right now, and they don't trust anybody. So they then they are siloed and they are attacking each other to include that new person coming in. So I have to be very careful and very strategic as I do what I do, but very very intentional in how I go about doing so. Is there a theme? Because you've been in a bunch. You've either had to interim or you've been brought in as a as basically an outside. Mm-hmm. Investigator or forensic auditor, uh, are there themes you see of why there's a breakdown? Is there, or is it is it just so different every time that there's not some consistent themes or issues? Or well, it, there are some consistency, but but every situation, although there are some consistencies, they're they're all different. Yeah. Um, and the and the four themes that I just mentioned is. Usually when I get that call, the underbelly of the organization is showing. That means toxicity. And that also means cannibalism is happening within the, within the system itself. And there is a divide between the community and the police and the council. All of that stuff is going on at the same time. They're all fighting each other. Nobody trusts anyone. Yeah. So I come, I come in and I, I look at all of those things. That's the first thing that's happening. And then you also see that there's, the us versus them between leadership and the troop. Uh, they don't trust the troop and the troop don't trust them. And then you have uh, those who are, are outspoken. Mm-hmm. Um, they are, are are shut down. And that's the last people you want to shut down. You, you need the outspoken individuals in a roundabout way. Some of the stuff that they're saying is rhetoric, but at the same time, there are some nuggets that if you listen and you have the right ear to be able to hear it. They are telling you things that you need to hear. So that means that the organization is void of psychological safety. And then at the same time, you have mental health issues going on as well. And so one of the entities within that system that I immediately embrace is HR uh, because I know I'm going to need HR at some point to deal with an outcry. Every agency I've been a part of I've had to do a intervention of some sort. And what leadership failed to do is that uh, I failed to see oftentimes is that oftentimes they are the trigger because of the lack of leadership uh, that's happening within that organization. And they've broken the trust for that troop to come forward and feel safe enough to address an issue. Yes, sir. You mentioned the the outspoken 
go quiet. There's a great meme that says when your most passionate employee goes silent, mm-hmm. you're probably uh, the, heading towards the bottom of, of, of the problem and getting the things are getting worse. That's right. And that's exactly what it just made me think of is mm-hmm. when they're when you're passionate. Outspoken people are decide screw this. That's right. I just don't even have anything else to say. That's right. Probably got some problems. Oh yeah, they silo at that point. They don't care, and uh, they become willfully blind to things that are happening around them. When they're outspoken, is when you push your pull, and even if they're your adversary, your objective is to turn them into an ally because you don't ever want to take the voice away. There are some of your 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 most passionate leaders within the organization. You just need to know how. To trans, trans, transform that energy into, into the positive things that you, that you need. Yep. What I'm not saying is that that's easy to do. It's very difficult to do. But again, I go back to the, the relationship building. The leader going into that organization, you need to be very intentional. And in what you're doing all day, every day is building what I call idiosyncrasy credits. Because and, and you're building those things for the next mistake that you, the leader, will make. Because every leader is going to make mistakes, but you need to be able to have money in the bank to pay off those mistakes when you make them. And a lot of leaders are bankrupt. Building capital. Yeah, absolutely. They have zero. And when you don't have the capital, you're not going to be able to get past that next mistake. And that is where you guys end up coming into these organizations oftentimes is when that leader is bankrupt, a member of that organization will reach out to you guys. And then you go in and you do the things in which you do. And oftentimes that, that administrator is gone. A couple of things that I was going to touch on is my, <coughs> excuse me, my exposure and bringing me into TMPA occurred in Marshall. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where me and Clint met. Uh, looking back on my career, certain, there are certain things that I could have done different. I was the president of the local association. That's going to be a lot of our viewers and watchers. Uh, and viewership of this podcast, one of the biggest mistakes that I, as the local association leader, uh, felt like we had a police chief that needed to be gone. Clint was instrumental in getting that done. Uh, but what I what happened ultimately ended up happening is that we did a basically a silent vote to the city manager um, that he needed to be removed, and we did it, and he was he was gone. But what I saw after the fact, uh, and the chief there now is, is is good people, and he I think he's a good leader. But what it did is it almost like we, 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 we blew our wad as an association and anything after the fact we couldn't correct and we couldn't, we, there was no accountability from that because we became more powerful than the leadership of, of the department. Yeah. Yeah. So in your instance, in your experience, talking to local association leadership, their line level employees. And because just like Aaron Slater said, uh, there's no le- rank is not amongst leadership. That's the right. leaders. That's right. There's no, right. So, what advice would you tell local leaders and local association leadership on what's the best way to handle those type of situations? Well, I'll tell you the way I handle when I go in as a chief. The first person I want to meet is the association president. Perfect. And for me, I want to meet that person because he or she has power, and I consider that person to be a chief of police, just like I am. They are the voice of the people. So I don't make any critical decisions without that person being in the room. And I want it just like uh, when you look at um, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was very strategic. There's a great book called Team of Rivals. And what Abraham Lincoln did is he put people around him that opposed him. But at the same time, they wanted the very same things he wanted. So to avoid groupthink, I want adversarial people in my space to challenge my thinking. The last thing any chief should want to do is have ultimate power to make decisions because although you may have the best interest of that agency at, 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 in your heart, but you can make a decision that will create major problems over here. And if you're autocratic and not democratic as far as decision making, then you're making mistakes. Win the battle and lose the war. Yes, yes. You need to have people around you. There's another great book written by a guy by the name of uh, Dr. John Townsend. The Townsend. The title of the book is People Fuel. And what he talks about is having an inner circle. That inner circle is is crucial to your decision making. So, yes, the first thing I do is I meet 
with that association president and I t- asked him a question. What do you need from me? What What's the theme in the organization? What's going on? Who do I need to know? Who do I need to meet? What do we need to do together to move this department forward? And I can confirm he's done that yeah. multiple times. Well, and, <clears throat> and, and, and to the association leadership out there, when someone is just in your position asks you those questions, I challenge you to be thoughtful on how you respond to that. Your first response to someone who comes in and is trying to reorganize the city, reorganize the police department, is not to splurt out there and go ahead and, and, and out the changes that you think need to be made. They'll, they will figure that out on their own. That's what right. I mean by that is is that your first interaction with this man or anyone that represents these type of leadership organizations is, man, the chief's a piece of crap. This is the challenges that we've gone. That's not your first. You don't need no. to. You don't need to out that from the get go. He will develop that on his own and realize, hey, there are some significant leadership challenges here. Get to know the individual coming in and trying to fix your department. Get to know them as a people or as a person, and then they will figure it out. Now you can assist them in trying to. Hey, did you did you witness what just happened here? But they they will see that. But a lot of times we see it because. Leader, association leaders are so passionate. They're so emotion. There's a lot of emotion. And you go back to mental health. This is their community. This yeah. is their world. So yeah. you have. So again, it goes back to the challenges you yeah. face when you go into those yeah. kind of situations. Yeah. So kudos to you for doing that. But it's also aggravating sometimes from our perspective because man, they've got a situation where local association leaders can make such an impact, and they do it. They don't start off on the on, on the right foot. Yeah, and that's a mistake on the part of the association president. You got to go in. Um, um, very, uh, it's a delicate balance yeah. when you go into those situations because it, it, one of the things that happen when, when they assign a new chief, everybody Googles and everybody is looking for dirt. And so we use that dirt as leverage and that's the wrong thing. You give that person the benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. because that person's character through adversity, will be revealed. Yep. And so what the association president need to do is develop that relationship around that person and with that person, but at the same time, make sure the association is synergistically sound so that if they need to rally to address issues with that incoming or that new person, that they still have a voice and they still have leverage. You don't, you, you know, we all have what we call bases of power. Don't overuse your coercive power, your legitimate power, your expert power, your information power. Don't overuse any of those things. Use them very strategically as a association president, as a chief, because there need to be some uh, collaboration between the two and reciprocation back and forth. Because that, that, that incoming person, if they're honest, they cannot be successful without that association president Mm -hmm. and the association president need to realize that they have tremendous power, but don't overuse any component of your power. Exactly. Just lay low, work with that person, give them the benefit of the doubt. And eventually the true character of that individual who's in that seat now will be revealed. And when that happens, now you have the leverage to do whatever you need to do in addressing that person, but don't go in and, and, attack right away because that person isn't going to show you who they actually are. Yep. You've got to build a relationship first. Well, and that's in everything we do. Bottom line of policing is relationship. Yeah. But the beautiful part about what I've always respected, there's a lot of guys that call themselves, you know, career interims or, you know, they go around and you, you leave everywhere you've been better off than when you arrived. And there's some people in this business attempting to do what you're doing, and I won't name their names, but they actually go into a broken place, and they they either leave it as broken as it is, or sometimes they they even tear it up even more on their way out the door. Mm -hmm. And I think what has been unique that I valued in you, if you know you're only going somewhere six weeks or six months, you don't fall in love with that place. You Mm -hmm. don't. I'm gone in six months Mm -hmm. for you people. I don't care. And that's not how you manage that. But I've literally watched other people that do what you do Mm -hmm. 
they go in, they could care less about the people there. They could care less the changes that they're making and how drastically it's affecting it. And it's not, it, it's happened before where they leave it actually worse. Yeah. More yeah. damage than the damage that was already there when they arrived. And yeah. you've, whatever that unique ability you have, um, to go in and, and fix that. I always use the analogy when we do management surveys. I'll tell the association leadership, I'm about to go meet with a chief and present the results of the survey. There's there's one or two, there's a fork in the road. Do you want me to go in and say, hey, these are the issues. We we want daddy to stay, and we want marriage counseling, and we want we want the family to reconcile, and we want to work on these issues. Or do I need to tell dad to move out, and, and we want the house, and he needs to leave? And a while ago when you were saying that people end up siloed and you know, the chief has barricaded himself in the bunker and the troops have decided they're done with him and, you know, they want to, they want to assassinate the general and everybody's siloed when you show up. Well, it's almost just like a divorce. Yeah. When the marriage is bad, yep. you're both living in the house. Nobody's talking. Right. You can't stand to even see them when you pass them in the hall. That's right. You're certainly not going to communicate. It's not healthy. Your mental health's deteriorating because that's a bad, and that's about what it's like in these departments. That's right. Consistently. Mm-hmm. And one of the challenges I, I face when I do these management surveys, when I talk with the associations, I'll say, tell me which fork in the road we're taking. Counseling and we're staying married, keep dad at home or the other route. And they'll give me whichever direction they feel the body of the association wants to go in. And every time they'll go, how do you think it's going to go? And I said, well, he's either going to be dismissive and minimize and this is nothing, or he's going to explode and throw me out of out of the building. Um, probably one of those two, and they'll say, "Well, you don't think he's going to like self reflect and you know acknowledge well, maybe?" And I'm like, about ninety nine percent chance, no, I don't think that's going to happen. And very rare occasions, his chief, his chief got <laughs> condescending and arrogant and told me, "I challenge you to come get my job. Mm. I challenge you to come get me." Um, do you see, once you've been in a position too long, do you become over comfortable, over confident? What, the last one, um, was an agency in North Texas and they said, the association called me on speakerphone and said, Hey, if you were the chief, what would you do right now? And I said, I would call in a, a mandatory department wide meeting for in the morning and I would stand up and say, Hey, I've obviously got our ship listing if not about to flip Mm -hmm. i'm gonna own my part of it Mm -hmm. i'd like for you guys to own whatever but what can we do let's start i i'm the captain of the ship i'll take it i'll I'll ride the ship to the bottom but starting right now what can we do and they said well do you think he's going to do that i'm like oh hell no Mm -hmm. And, and he didn't he blew up and it was all their fault and he was perfect never done anything wrong but we see it again and again and again and sometimes in city manager roles, what is it about? Is it the position? Is it being in it too long? Is it overconfidence? Is it, do you, do you have thoughts on that? Well, the answer to your question is yes. Um, all of the above could be possibly the problem. But what I see um, is we, you know, you know, I'll talk from the law enforcement perspective uh, first, um, uh, the person sitting in that seat have a very difficult time in apologizing for mistakes made. The chief. Uh, yes, yes. That is the most difficult thing to do, but it's the most, the, the, the most inexpensive, expensive thing to do is just yep. simply apologize and say, listen, I, I screwed up. I didn't think this thing through very well. Um, and I like to write this ship. Uh, here's, the information that I did not provide to you that I need to provide to you and provide that information. And oftentimes the officers will be fairly forgiving and you move forward. But if you allow uh, too much time and space in between speaking up and speaking out about those things, then it becomes very difficult for you to gain any momentum to get in front of the narrative that has been created because of a variety of issues. Is it the culture 
that doesn't allow them to come forward sometimes and say, you know what, I thought this was going to work, it didn't, or I thought this, that's like a couple of years ago at my department, they decided we do away with the gang unit because that way we don't have a gang problem if we don't have a gang unit. And we're going to do away with undercover work, and then we don't have to have a drug problem. And it lasted, I think, 18 months, and it was a complete train wreck. And suddenly they came back, and it, it tore the department up. I mean, people were furious about it. But, man, it would have been a great opportunity to come forward and be like, hey, man, I, have, I, I, I wanted to look at something, or I believed that this was going to lead to something, and it clearly didn't. I know you're pissed at me, um, and I own it, but we're developing the gang unit again. You know, we're going to get this thing it was just never. It just suddenly it was. Yeah. I, 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 the best way to answer that question, Clint, is number one, uh, don't put yourself in those positions to where you have to be autocratic. And when you become an autocratic leader, then you're, you're, you're actually making yourself extremely vulnerable. This is why you need that inner circle. You should not make any critical decisions in that agency without having that inner circle play a role in it your cabinet yeah you got to have it you, i mean it's imperative and you got to have a cabinet that you don't create uh groupthink so when you look at the composition of a team that team is either very homogenous meaning they're very similar in nature or they're very heterogeneous which is very diverse it doesn't matter which if it's homogenous or heterogeneous, the key is avoiding group think. I need people in my space that are willing to challenge me to get my attention when they see the micro issues that I am about to put out and make a macro issue. So one of the, the things that I do is I teach leaders how to focus on the micro to mitigate the macro without being called a micromanager. And that is very strategic in nature. Uh, and it goes back to, I think the, you probably have heard me say this time and time and time again on this podcast, relationships. Yeah. Relationships are crucial. And I'm, I'm by nature, I'm very introverted. But I know as an executive, I cannot be. So I have to learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yep. So I put myself in these positions because the most valuable commodity within the organization are people. And that ship will not sail without healthy individuals doing the work that I need them to do. But they got to be able to trust the person steering the ship. And that's me. And so the only way that they're going to do that is I have to expose who I am and allow myself to be vulnerable in their presence. And one of the things that cops, especially leadership, will not do is allow vulnerability to become their superpower. <laughs> because vulnerability is actually a superpower as well as compassion. And see, when, when you when you look at the, the grand scheme of things in this profession, police officers live 20 years less than general population, 20 years less. And it's because of the toxicity within the, in these organizations. And it's a lot of times it starts with leadership. Yep. Now, the most powerful people within the organization was that first line supervisor. So what we don't do and should begin to do is dump as much of our resources at that first line level of leadership, FTOs, corporals, and first line supervisors, because they're the ones with the power. That's your that's your power right there in that in those small units, and we ignore that group of people. And, and you can't, you absolutely can't. I sit in my Apple Tower making decisions that affect the needs folks, and I'm not even getting their input. That's for the sake. You don't go to war. A general doesn't win a war. All those sergeants out there with a bunch of squads and platoons. Execute mission. That's who's winning. That's who wins your war. Is the sergeants that are entrenched with the troops and leading the way. A general sitting in D.C. is not going to win. That's right. Yep. Well, that's a great analogy. One of the uh, one of the cool things about Mike is he walks the walk. He talks the talk. The leadership stuff he's talking about. You can go to all these leadership classes and read these supervisor books, and it's all this fluffy stuff. But 
the cool thing about Mike is I've known him, I don't know, a dozen years probably. He talks about the vulnerability and he talks about being having a relationship. Me and Mike have known each other, I guess, 12, 10 or 12 years. Mm-hmm. There's times we butt heads. Right. Sometimes we butt heads pretty passionately. Yeah. And then we go break bread, go have lunch, right. and... He's, he's still a good friend of mine. I still respect the living hell out of him. But he doesn't get mad that I'm mad at him, or I don't get mad that he disagrees with what I'm... It, well, you know why it is, though, to go back to your point. It's because you guys have a relationship. Yeah, and we want the same thing. That's right. We just, at the moment, we can't see each other's way. Right. And until we get at the table, have that conversation, he understands my perspective, and I understand his. And what we do is we don't compromise, we reconcile yeah. for the betterment of all. Yep. Respect and relationship. And it's never been, well, screw him, I'm not going to take his call or I'm not going to. Literally, we've had passionate disagreements and then we'll get back on the phone and chat up and get along. Hey, bro, how's your family? And, or we'll go eat Mexican food. And yeah. that's, that's where I grew my respect because... Yeah. A lot of leaders, well, you disagree with them, they'll screw you, or now you're on evenings with Tuesdays and Thursdays off, or, man, it's never remotely been that way. And all of his stops where he goes in fixing, um, you know, he'll call me and there's issues going on and we'll talk it through, or the troops will call me, hey, I don't know who the hell this new guy is, but, and I'm like, well, give it time and see how this thing plays out. Well, then they quit calling because things, things work out, and man, some of the stops are challenging. There's, You've been in some racially charged communities where things are simmering. You've been in some departments where things are are boiling and simmering. And yeah, I want to touch on that just for a second because you're, you're primarily in Texas mm-hmm. with your leadership stuff uh, mm-hmm. that, 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 that you do. And we see at TMBA uh, how challenging is Texas because it's such a large state and there's so many different regions and the culture in each region is so significantly different. And you ran into seeing... The cultural differences in, uh, uh, within Texas and in, in, in the regions that you have worked. I have. I have. Um, East Texas, you know, I, I ran into um, some racism. Mm-hmm. Um, in Southeast Dallas, I ran into some racism. Um, but at the same time, here's the, the, what, I, what I will call it more than uh, racism is ignorance. Yeah. When people don't know what they don't know, it becomes my responsibility to educate. Um, so I don't make assumptions about things that people say and do. Um, I look at it as an opportunity to educate uh, so that we can all move forward. Because a lot of times, um, just like me, I grew up a certain way and I believed certain things until I came face to face with those things. You got educated around those things and, and all, all those perceptions went away. And so it becomes my opportunity to do the very same thing when I when I run across things. But um, and then when I North West Texas wasn't any of that stuff per se, but there were other issues yeah. uh, that were happening there. Um, but I spent most of my time either in East Texas or the Metroplex as chief and city manager in East Texas. But I've worked all over Texas, dealing with all kinds of issues. Um, Some of those things are absolutely unbelievable. I've been in one particular situation where I was scared to death uh, of uh, getting out of that town alive. Um, That particular situation actually made national news. Uh, I won't necessarily, it's it's in the public domain, I still don't want to mention it, but... um, that situation was a very, very difficult situation. Uh, and it, the only other time outside of Texas that I ran into a situation like that was I was doing some work in, in Hollywood, Florida. And the same kind of situation happened. And I was with another executive out of, out of Florida. And we literally had to get on the phone with people uh, that, and stayed on the phone with them until we got out of that county. Uh, because of, of the fear that we had, because we were challenging the agency and some of the unethical things that were going on within that system. 
But this is also around the time where uh, DOJ was was implementing consent decrees mm-hmm. across the country. Pittsburgh being the first city to to uh, end up in a consent decree. But I've I've gone into a lot of agencies that were either going in or coming out mm-hmm. of those consent decrees. So I've seen some things in my time, and and as Clint uh, mentioned, I just kind of have developed a kind of a a process when I go in because nothing necessarily surprised me. There are a lot of things that disappoint me, but they don't surprise me. And I always, to the best of my ability, to give the person the benefit of doubt. Even when other people have given up on them, I don't give up on them immediately uh, because I know that a lot of the person's problems were not created by them. The the system itself. You know, one of the the people that I admire a lot, I, and I met him once, is Kevin Gilmartin in his book, Emotional Survival. And one of the things he talks about is that the profession in and of itself is predisposed to creating mental casualties. So if I know that going in, then I know when people are sideways with themselves and sometimes they get caught up and they don't know how to help themselves. Mm-hmm. So... I just look at myself being the conduit to be able to help them to the point where I can't help them anymore. But I have to do everything I possibly can to help that individual help themselves before I let them go. And that's a true statement because I watched him give second chances and third chances. No. And no. he keeps trying to build and uplift and rebuild and stand people back up. Yeah. But sometimes can't help themselves and he's still trying to prop them up. Yeah, and then, you know, I, I, I read a lot. I read a lot. Leadership stuff. There's another author by the name of uh, Dr. Henry Cloud. Mm-hmm. And to Clint's point, the title of the book is Necessary Endings. And what Cloud talks about is pruning. So occasionally for the fruit to grow on the branches, on the vines, you got to prune. So, yes, you have to release people from time to time. But before I do so, I want to make sure that I've done everything I possibly could do for that individual because that person has gotten caught up not by themselves in and of themselves. Sometimes the system, uh, they get caught up. And I know my wife is a therapist, um, and so she deals with a lot of these issues as well. And so I know that people can get caught up so much that they don't know how to help themselves. And so I, I do everything I can to help them first. It's a lot, of, a lot of good information that he's he's uh, he's talking about today. I yep. hope I hope people are resonating it and writing it down and and processing what you're saying. I'm Clint, glad y'all got to meet. I knew you guys would. Oh yeah, Clint likes to ask this question, and I think you'd be a, a great person to ask. What's your best and worst day in Mike Mike Alexander? My best day is um, when I know at the end of the day I made a difference. And uh, dealing with people, places, or things. Um, my worst day is when I think, I guess, when I feel helpless and I can't do what I know I need to do or want to do. And that can, that can mean anything. Now that's, that's such a profound question and such an ambiguous question at the very same time. But... Um, I think, you know, just off the top of my head, that's, that's my best answer. Uh, I want to always do the best I can for the individual. Why? Partly because I want the same in return. And I do believe it's a paradox. That's a great And point. it's a bi- biblical principle. Uh, it's, it's more blessed to give than receive. And I know the more I give, the more I receive. So I do my best to give, 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 give. And I don't expect in return, but I know that mine is coming as well because there will be a day when I need to lean on a Clint to help me stand when I can't. Yeah. But I like on the first part of that, too. If you're going to expect greatness or demand greatness, then you, you better be displaying that, too. That's right. That's you, right. You're not, you're not playing your C game expecting the A game out of everybody else if you're in your C game. That's right. I like that. Yeah. Um, one other one we ask, I know you, you just turned 42 years old. (laughs) 
Yes, sir. What would 42-year-old Mike Alexander say to 15-year-old Mike Alexander right now? Wow. Man, I think that question should have been asked the first question, and we have spent the entire, I, you know, I made so many mistakes. Um, Clint, I made so many mistakes as a 15-year-old, as a 40-year-old. I really, this is the honest truth, I believe, that I really did not know Mike Alexander until I was four, about 40 years old. I just made so many mistakes along the way. Um, and at some point I woke up. Some people wake up a lot sooner than I did. But eventually I woke up. And uh, if I had to do it all over again, I would immediately, the best of my ability, surround myself with people who are a lot more intelligent than I and just sit back and absorb as much information as I possibly can from them so that when I need to dip into that well for some of that wisdom to use as I grow and move about life, that I, I have enough in the bank to be able to do so. You found it at 40. Honestly, I'm 51, and I don't think until I, my mid-40s did I realize I think I'm hitting my stride. I feel like I know kind of where I'm going. Mm -hmm. And to your point about surrounding yourself, whether people like George W. or not, and some people you know, say he's brilliant and some people say he's dumb redneck, W. surrounded himself with brilliant people, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a bunch of people in his circle because W. knew I'll surround myself with people that will have answers that I may not have at times. And um, whether folks like him or not, I think he did a phenomenal job of being Angry. aware enough to surround himself with people like Condoleezza Rice, who's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Um, and that he could dip into that well and, and use Dr. Rice's knowledge and um, experience when he needed it. Yes. Yeah. You got anything else, Big Dog? Where can people, so you're teaching at um, ACC. I know you call me sometimes when you're up in the Metroplex mm -hmm. teaching. Is that Aaliyah? Or? Well, it, it may be Aaliyah. It may be Carruth. It may also be the TPCA. I do a lot of work for Texas Police Chiefs. I do a lot of work for Aaliyah. I do a lot of work for Carruth. And I do a lot of work over at ACC. And then, of course, the Lion Institute, which is my website. Um, there's a lot of things that I do there. Um so I'm on Facebook. I, I, I have a Facebook account. I never go there. I have a, a Instagram account. I also have, uh, the, the website. And I think there's, uh, used to be Twitter. Yeah, LinkedIn. I have a LinkedIn account and then the Twitter account, X, now better known as X. So I have all of that. Um, I, I don't go there. The only place I spend some time occasionally is on LinkedIn. Speaking of great leaders in TPCA, Chief Ellis mm -hmm. just got appointed yes, executive is. director of TPCA. Yes. Freaking phenomenal leader. Yes, he is. Very, very good dude. And T. Cole just announced their new executive director. Yes. Um, Chief Greg Stevens. Yes. Another very, very good guy. Two great choices, yes. like in the week time period. Yes. You know, two good men, uh, two good leaders, and two good people that are going to be excellent for Texas law enforcement. Yes, and I'll be working very closely with the both of them. That's awesome. Two really, really good men. Mm -hmm. Well, we like to end each episode with three rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Did you study? Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> no, I didn't, but I'm, I, I think I'm ready. What's your favorite cop movie or line from a cop movie? Your favorite police vehicle? And your favorite drink of choice when you are relaxing off the clock? My favorite uh, police movie. Uh, is actually The Wire. Um, the Wire is fairly old now. It came out in 2007 or 8, but it's still relevant today. In fact, I used The Wire as uh, a part of um, a leadership academy that oh, I wow. teach. Yeah. So week two, I do a three-week leadership academy for TPCA. The first week is about the individual. The second week is about groups. And the third week is about the organizational system itself. And week two, when I'm trying to build and grow a synergistically sound group, 
I use the wire because they ended up in that situation. It's loosely based off of Baltimore, Maryland Police Department, where they had a lot of drug folks, drug dealers killing folks. So the agency put together a task force built with narcotics, officers, and homicide. And these two groups typically don't work together. So they got together and they were fighting a lot of, of each other because of the unfamiliarity of their different disciplines. So I use that to show how to build a synergistically sound team to move that team forward, to build that cadence necessary in order to attack whatever you need to attack. So uh, that's my favorite movie. As far as police vehicle, uh, you know, I really don't have one. Um, but if you if you go back uh, when I first started, this may sound strange, but we had uh, it, it one is most people probably wouldn't agree with this one, but I, that Dodge Diplomat. Yeah, I kind of I, I kind of enjoyed that vehicle back then, um, and I don't remember the third question. Favorite drink of choice when you're relaxing off the clock? I, I drink um, uh, a what they call the Honor Palmer. Oh yeah, yeah. That's my my drink of choice. Yes, yeah. I just sit back. Um, I bought a piece of property out in the, the hill country, and I just sit back in the back porch, watch the the livestock come through the backyard, and uh, just sit back there and enjoy. When and the, some downtown. the Texas hill country is just absolutely gorgeous. Yes, it is. It is yeah, beautiful. I'm, I'm out, right up by the lake, a um, couple minutes from the lake, and the deer come up. I got. This big barrel, I just feed them. And, uh, back in the day, I hunted them a lot, but now I, I've even named quite a few of them. <laughs> now yeah. pets, and they yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. That's I, awesome. I can relate to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, man, you got anything else? Cannot thank you enough for the time coming down. I know you're busy, and I know you're always yeah. on the road. Every time I talk to you, you're somewhere in a different part of Texas. But um, appreciate you taking the time to come on. I appreciate your friendship, uh, your mentorship. And uh, love having you all. Yep, yep. Thank you for coming on, man. Uh, it's 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 unique and 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 cool to see. Uh, I know about you, and I, I I've witnessed some things that you've done. And for you to go into the environments and situations that you do and fix those, and then just kind of walk away quietly uh, and look at the things that you've built up uh, is phenomenal. A lot of times you see leadership where they they demand accolades and they demand. You know the 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 notoriety and in mm-hmm. the respect, and you just you're, you're it's just not your character. No. So, kudos to you for doing that. Thank you guys. I truly appreciate the opportunity that you guys afforded me today to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. I love leadership, and I love policing, and I love the officers. And all I want to to see before I leave this side of life is that Austin. Uh, get it right. Yeah. It, it needs to come back to some of the things that we once represented. And uh, uh, I think that they're on their way. Things have to get worse before they get better. But yeah. I think that they are, they will, they will right that ship at some point. Yep. I'm going to make a prediction right now. We're going to watch the analytics of this episode. And I think this will be the most watched episode by females. Mm. Because my man <laughs> sounds like Barry White on the microphone. My man sounds like Barry White on the microphone. He said, man, why? just keep talking. Let's just roll. Just, let's roll this and you just keep talking. Uh, you, you guys are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> man, you guys stay safe out there. Uh, happy holidays from Google Grip. You guys hit the comments, hit the like button, and subscribe. Appreciate you guys tuning in. God bless you. And as always, may God bless Texas. We're out.